But yeah, so I'm excited to get into the message today. Um, because it's not just a message I feel like God has been speaking to me, but it's kind of a message He's having me live out in my life. And so He's tested me on it. He's had me walking down this message. And so I'm excited to share it with you this morning. And so I hope this morning that you hear what God wants to say to you through the message, right? I might say a lot, and I just hope that you hear what God, what the Spirit wants to say to you, and you take that and you run with that. So let's get right into it. So I want to start this morning with a question. Do you know there is eternity in you? Do you know there is eternity in you? I know that might be a hard question to comprehend or to think about right off the bat because we're in a world where it's constant change. Everything in the world is changing. Everything is fast-paced. It's moving quickly, right? You just learned how to post on Facebook and to like a Facebook post. And now your kids are telling you about a hundred different apps. It's now Instagram. It's TikTok. It's threads. And so everything's changing so quick. Right? It's like you, you left your house this morning and there's a new pothole on your road that you now have to dodge on your way to church. And so this idea of lasting long, of enduring for a long time is becoming less and less normal in our everyday world. But eternity is not talking about lasting long. It's not talking about enduring. It's talking about lasting forever, for all time, without end, never coming to a stop. And you have that in you. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11 says this, Yet God has made everything beautiful in its time. He has set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. God has set eternity in our hearts. We all have eternal life within us, right? We're all going to live, whether we're going to spend eternity in heaven or hell, that is up to our decision, whether we're going to believe in Jesus or not, but we're going to spend eternity somewhere. We have eternal life placed within us, from God. It's why everyone, even people that don't believe in Jesus, are so fascinated by what happens after death. Because something in us tells us there's more than just this life, this temporary life. Eternal life is set. But this is what I love about our God and how good He is. Because Roman tells us God has called us according to His purpose. You see, God didn't just give and put eternal life in you, but He also put an eternal purpose to that eternal life for you. And so I'm here to maybe just stir up someone because you know there has to be more to life than just waking up, surviving, eating, watching a TV show, and going back to bed. There has to be more than just this life, this temporary existence on earth. There has to be something more. And I'm here to tell you, yes, there's an eternal purpose that God has placed in you to go along with the eternal life He's given you. But it gets even better. Because God didn't just give you an eternal life and an eternal purpose. But you also set in your heart an eternal desire. So that means alongside your eternal life and your eternal purpose, there's a desire to go and fulfill that eternal purpose. In other words, there's something in you that wants to do it. There's something in you that yearns, that wants to have more than just the temporary. We all know what it is to have temporary desires. Maybe you skipped breakfast this morning. and So right now you are feeling that temporary desire for food, that hunger. But when you get home today and you eat, it's going to be gone. It's going to be satisfied. And so something in us, we, we know what it is to have temporary desires, but something in us also knows there's something that has to be more. We have to be a part. We have to have something more than just that which is finite, that which, is, which will come to an end somewhere along the line. So I want to tell you a, a quick personal story about how I had to wrestle between temporary desires and the eternal desire placed in my heart. And so, you know, I've always been a big dreamer with lots of big desires and things I want out of life. And I've almost always had this confidence about me that I could go and I could get it, I could achieve it, I could go and satisfy all these desires. And so my ideal life was to be some wealthy, influential, well-regarded businessman out in the world just living the life. And my life was kind of on track to go there. Straight out of school, I went into the corporate world Um, And I was also studying at the same time. And so my life was kind of, it looked like it was heading down that path of of getting wealth, reputation, status, all the works. And then about three years in, as God would have it, I found myself just for a season helping out um, with the youth year at church. And in that season, God started to stir something in me that he started to stir and awaken that eternal desire that he had placed in my heart from the moment I was born. And so I had to wrestle because my my desires were warring against each other. 
I mean, ministry is great, but I don't see myself being a, be, being a wealthy, influential business person if I'm doing ministry. And so, to kind of help me know what he wanted out of me, he gave me a picture. And so, one Sunday as I was worshiping, I was just standing and, and I just saw this picture. I was looking into this blacksmith shop, and in the shop there was the fire and the metal, and people were working away at the metal, hammering away at this blacksmith. And all the people in the blacksmith were my co-workers from, from where I was working at the time. And I looked at that, and something in me just felt like, that work isn't where God wants me. And so I kind of looked over my shoulder, and there in the distance there was a wheat field. And in the wheat field there was all these people just working at the wheat field. And I felt like God saying, that's where I want you, in my wheat field collecting the harvest. And so I just felt like something in me belonged there. That eternal desire said, that's where you belong. And I really believe in each of us there is an eternal desire placed. But I want you to make no mistake. I'm not saying that eternal desire is to do ministry. You see, God's eternal purpose for your life is not necessarily just um, relegated to people that are in full-time ministry or doing that stuff. His eternal purpose, his eternal desire is so much bigger than that. He wants you to be a part of something eternal. We all want that deep inside. There's something in there that says we have to be a part of something that lasts forever. And that thing that we get to be a part of, each and every one of us, is his kingdom. Is building, is advancing God's kingdom. You see, in Psalms it says, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And your dominion endures throughout all generations. Psalms 145 verse 13. So his kingdom is that thing that's going to satisfy that eternal purpose. That eternal desire within us. It's advancing. It's being a part of his kingdom. And it doesn't matter if you're a plumber, a parent, a mother, a grandfather, a doctor, an athlete, an artist. Whatever it is you're doing, there is a kingdom role for you to fulfill in that place right where you're at. You just need to look for it. (laughs) If you guys are wondering, some of the young guys nowadays, if you say something they like or they think it's good, they say sugar. So you're welcome to say that. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Cool. So there is a role for you to fulfill for the kingdom of God. Right where you're at. Right where you're at. Whatever you are doing, there is a role. You just need to look for it. You know, just the other day, God kind of stirred this eternal desire and satisfied it for me. And it just reminded me of how sweet it is when we get to live out a life that is satisfying that eternal desire placed deep within us. So the other day I took some of the, the young guys down to Jeffrey's Bay for a conference and on the last night they were doing baptisms. Now I know how much we love baptisms when they happen here, yeah, how we cheer, how excited we get. And so they were doing baptisms and I was sitting like in the middle back of Victory Church, right? So it's, it's quite a wide, quite a big church and I was sitting at the back The baptisms were happening all the way at the far front right-hand corner. And so every time they would take a youth under the water and bring him out, I would find myself almost pumping my fists in the air like like my sports team just scored a point or something. Um, And I was smiling. At one point, I wasn't sitting. I think I was jumping. I was probably shouting a bit too. And I must have looked a little odd to the people around me because all the action was happening that side of the church, and I was all the way that at the back on the other side of the church, but I just couldn't help myself. I was just so joyful, and something in me was just coming alive every time I saw these, these youth coming out the water, seeing God's kingdom advancing. That's how excited, that's how filled up I was just looking at God's kingdom advancing. Because these youth that were getting baptized, I didn't know them at all. I had no relationship, no interaction with them. I had no part in playing and getting them to that point of being baptized, and yet this is how excited I was. Imagine if it was one of the guys that came with me that I knew that was getting baptized. I would have done laps around the church probably. And so that's how amazing just seeing God's kingdom advancing. Imagine if I was partaking in it also. Imagine how satisfied each and every one of us would be if we not only saw but we partook in the advancing of God's kingdom, in the advancement of God's kingdom. There is a purpose and a fulfillment for all of us that can only be satisfied by the kingdom of God, that kingdom that is everlasting, that is without end, that endures forever. Now, perhaps when I was speaking, you were like about how excited and you know, happy I get when I was watching these, these, these youth get baptized, and you're like, I get that 100%. That's me. You know, I love it when I just see things that are advancing God's kingdom. I'm so excited. I'm filled up. But maybe you're on the other end of the spectrum. And you're like, actually, I haven't really felt excited or filled up 
with kingdom stuff for quite a while. Like when people get baptized, you know, I know it's good, but it doesn't really excite me. You know, kingdom stuff haven't really excited me for a long time. I don't really feel filled up by them. I mean, I have to tell you, it's not that the desire for eternity, that the desire for God's kingdom is not in your heart. It's there. It's set by God in your heart. But it's so easy to push it down, to get it covered up by the things of this world, by the temporary. It's so easy to cover that desire by layers and layers of other desires and priorities and longings. And so I hope this morning on a mission, or I'm on a mission this morning rather, to try to wake up that desire, to try to bring it up to the top of our hearts, myself included, because taking the desire for God's kingdom and putting it on the top of the desire pile is an everyday process that we have to go through. And it doesn't matter if we're serving coffee, if we're playing sports, if, we, if we're having lunch, if we're watching TV, we need to always have this intention of making sure at the top of our desire, at the top of our hearts, is God's kingdom. See, it's not so much about changing what you do, it's changing the way you think about what you are doing. So it's not, don't watch TV, don't, don't go for lunch, obviously don't serve, don't play, do all those things, but always do it with the mindset of, I'm here to put God's kingdom first. And it might not change what you do, but the intention will change what God does in and through you as you're doing those things. See, sometimes we feel like we have to do a lot, like we have to make something happen for God's kingdom. But the honest truth is, if we just go into our everyday interactions and environments with the intention of putting God's kingdom first, His Spirit, His Holy Spirit will do the work and set up His advancing of His own kingdom through us. You know, Matthew says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. It's not easy to do that. It's not easy to put the desire for his kingdom above every other desire. Because not, I'm not saying desire, other desires are bad. Temporary desires are not bad at all. But if we, don't, if we put them first above his kingdom, they end up controlling, they end up determining how we live our lives instead of his kingdom. So it says, seek first his kingdom. If you read in Matthew 6, I think 22, it says, or no, a little further down, it says, you can't serve two masters. You will love the one, you will hate the other. You'll be devoted to the one, you'll despise the other. See, we have to come to a place where we trust God so much that all our earthly desires that are good, we say, God, we're going to trust you to fulfill these, and we're just going to focus on your kingdom. And we have to trust him enough to say he will fulfill all those other desires, because if I put them before him, they will become my master, and I will love them, not his kingdom, not his work, not him. I will be devoted to them instead of advancing his kingdom. And so, I want to stir up that desire for his kingdom, that eternally set desire that's going to last for all eternity, that's going to fulfill a purpose for our life without end. And so, our core scripture for today is going to be Matthew 6, verse 19 to 21, and it reads as follows. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven where the moth and the rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. I want to start by talking about the word storing up, right? Because it it says that the, the, the scripture is saying we mustn't store up earthly treasures. We must rather store up treasures in heaven. And so I want to talk about those two words, storing up. Because the two words, storing up, imply action. They imply Um, involvement, active doing on our part. See, this verse isn't saying Jesus is busy storing up treasures in heaven for us. It's saying we must go and store up treasures in heaven for ourselves. And so I think to to kind of give us a picture, let's use a farmer as an example. You see, when a farmer has to store up crop, it all starts with him planting the seed, and then he has to water the seed, and over time, through nurturing the seed, it grows and it produces. And then he has to go out into the field, and he has to harvest it, he has to collect it all up, and put it in a barn and store it all up. And so this entire process that the farmer goes through from planting the seed to watering it, to nurturing it, to harvesting it, to collecting it, to storing it up, it all involves active hands-on process. It involves him actively being a part of the process. And so Jesus is saying, almost the implication I get is he's saying, you're going to find yourself putting in all this work, all this effort, all this time to store up treasure, to store up something, and that work, that effort, it's all good. Just make sure it's not for earthly treasure. Make sure it's been put into storing up treasures in heaven for yourself. And so let's talk about treasure for a bit because 
we'll be told to store up treasure. See, treasure is something of great value. It is something of great value. And kingdoms, kingdoms are known by and operate on the substance of their treasure. In other words, the things of great value sustain a kingdom. They what make a kingdom. So things like the economy of a kingdom, that's an obvious one. The human resource of the kingdom, the leadership of the kingdom, the infrastructure, the army of the kingdom. These are all things of great value. These are all treasures of the kingdom that sustain, that make up the kingdom. Business is a great example of this, right? If you think about maybe like, say, four big key areas in business, right? The leadership, the human resources, the finances, and the infrastructure. These are all treasures of a business that it operates on. And the kingdom of God is just the same. There are treasures, there are things of great value that it operates on, that sustain it, that it's known by. And Jesus is almost inviting us to come and be a part of it. He's saying, come store up treasure for my kingdom. Come and be a part of building, of advancing my kingdom. And so he's inviting us to take our attention off the temporary and to turn it on to the eternal. He's inviting us to take our attention off earthly treasure and put it onto heavenly treasure. And so let's talk about treasure on earth and treasure in heaven because he's saying... Don't store up earthly treasure, store up heavenly treasure. And to, to, to do that effectively, we need to understand both things. We need to understand what is earthly treasure and what does it look like to try to store that up? And what does it look like to try to store up heavenly treasure for ourselves? So the first thing I want to say is Jesus calls a treasure on earth. In other words, he's saying these are things of great value, but they're temporary. They're just for this lifetime. See, he's not saying treasures in the world, the treasures of the world. I know when we read world in the Bible, we're like, that's often a, 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 a point to note. It's probably in a negative sense. It's probably, probably talking about a negative way. But Jesus is not saying treasures in the world. He's saying treasures on earth. In other words, these are things that are of great value. And there are many things of great value. For example, financial wealth is of great value. It opens up opportunities and makes things viable that are just not viable without it. Your physical health is of great value. Right? So many people are affected by issues of physical health. In fact, it's such a big issue that plagues people. If you read the gospel, a large majority of Jesus' miracles were physical healing miracles. He was healing the sick, giving the blind sight, the deaf ears, and the lame legs to walk. And so it's a big thing. It's of great value. Relationships are of great value. Almost every issue that someone is going through or is or has gone through, in some way can almost always be tied back to a bad relational moment or bad relation somewhere, somehow. But conversely, almost every good win or victory that someone has in some way can be tied to an influence of a good, godly relationship. So relationships are of great value. Knowledge is of great value. Our lives are greatly improved because of the increase of knowledge within this world. The world is constantly changing for the better in many ways because of the increase of knowledge. And so all these things are of great value. Things like emotional well-being, things like your self-image, things like influence, things like character, success, giftings. These are all things of great value. But what if I told you they were all earthly treasures? See, that verse in Matthew is going to take on a much different read if you read it do not store up for yourself physical health. Do not store up for yourself financial wealth. Do not store up for yourself success. Do not store up for yourself reputation. Do not store up for yourself character on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Now, if you were me, you're probably thinking, hang on, something's not quite making sense. But surely God wants me to be financially provided for and well off. Um, sure, surely relationships are important. I mean, of course they're important. We are known as Jesus' disciples by our love, and how do you love someone without a relationship? Surely my character's important to God. I mean, just read the Bible. It's constantly talking about who we are meant to be in Christ. And so let me just clarify what I am saying. All these things, financial wealth, your physical health, your relationships, your knowledge, your, your self-image, your character, your influence, they are all very, very important. In fact, it's even good to work on them, but they should never become the goal of your life. Because they are simply tools and pathways to achieving the goals. They are tools and pathways to collecting and storing up treasure in heaven for yourself. You see, if you make character the goal, right? If you pursue character for the sake of character, 
right? If you pursue virtuous character just because you want to be a virtuous person, you'll begin to idolize it. And slowly but surely, it'll begin to take you away from God, right? There are things now, like I think Stoicism is the most common example I can think of on my top of my head, where it's all about the character and that you remove God from the picture. And the devil is cunning. He will help you have a virtuous character if it means you do nothing for the kingdom of God, if it means you forsake the kingdom of God. So these things are all tools, they're all pathways. Let's take building a house, for example. You need tools to build a house. You need hammers, you need cutting tools, you need measurement tools, and a whole lot of other tools to build a house. But the objective is always still to build the house. See, if you didn't have the tools, you wouldn't be able to build a very effective house, right? Imagine trying to run a church without any money or trying to disciple people with no relationship to them or trying to minister to people with no character. It's probably not going to work very well. So if you had to try to build a house without any cutting tools, it's probably not going to be much of a house. But the objective is still the house. So what would happen if we made the objective, the goal, the tools and the equipment instead of building the house? Let's say I hired you to build a house for me, and I gave you one month to build a house, and then I left. And so in this process of building this house for me, you lost sight of the objective of the goal, and you began to focus on the tools and the equipment instead of building the house. So you spend all the time and the money busy collecting as many tools as you can get, and the best quality, and the most versatile tool set for building a house that could ever be collected and assembled. And then they say, after a month, I come back to see this house, and I find no house. And instead, you say, don't worry, come look at my tool set. Come look at all the equipment I've collected. It's the best of the best. I've got everything you can ever want to build a house. Do you think I'm going to be happy that you spent all, my t- all the money I gave you to build the house on building the tools to build the house? Yes, you, you, have, you have to have the right tools, and you need to care and maintain for the tools. Like, you need to care. You need to maintain your relationships. You need to steward your financial wealth well. You need to take care of your physical health. But they are still tools for advancing God's kingdom. They are still pathways through which we advance his kingdom. Because in the end of the day, we're not gifting these things to God. And so no matter how good something is, it cannot justify not focusing any time or energy on building the kingdom of God. Do you think one day we were able to stand before God and say, God, I know I didn't put any time and effort into your kingdom, but it's okay because look at all the great relationships I have. Or God, it's okay that I didn't do anything for you because look at all the financial wealth I accumulated. Or look how physically healthy I was my entire life. We don't gift these things to God because at the end of the day, they are temporary. Let's look at an example. Your character. You're not gifting God. The end. At the end of the life, you don't gift God your good, virtuous character. Because no matter how far along you came in this life to having a great virtuous character, it's nothing compared to the character you're going to have in eternity. God still has to finish the sanctifying work of sanctifying your character when you cross over to spend eternity with him. And so whether you're an inch or a mile away, it's still nothing compared to what it will be one day. And so yes, we please God. We bless God with our good character and our virtuous character. And by all means, it is a great tool and pathway through which we advance his kingdom. But it's not the goal. It's not the objective. Think about your relationships. I'm not going to a separate part of heaven than you just because we didn't get along on earth. So it doesn't matter if you get along with someone. Yeah, I mean, it does matter. But in the end, in eternity, whether you got along with someone or not, you're going to be in perfect relationship with them and with God. So whether you go to God at the end of your life and say, God, look how amazing I am. I only had one bad relationship my whole life. Whether you go to him and say, God, I actually had like 40 bad relationships in heaven, you'll be in perfect relationship. And so, yes, we please God, and we bless God with our good relationships. And it's one of the most powerful tools through which we advance his kingdom. But the goal isn't to just have as many great relationships as we can in this life. The objective still remains to advance his kingdom. You see, the moment we idolize earthly treasure, the enemy will always have the upper hand. Jesus warns us, if you focus on earthly treasures, there is moth moth and rust that will destroy it, and the thieves will break in, and they will steal it. So the moment you say, idolize your physical health, all the enemy has to do to control you is to control your health. 
Uh, to get you to move, he just has to affect your health. And over time, he'll get you to make the healthy choice over the godly choice. And so instead of building God's kingdom, you begin to build your own physical health. You begin to build your own kingdom. And it's easy. It's so easy for us to get into a place where we begin to build our own kingdoms instead of God's kingdom. It happens to the best of us. It's why we need each other to be around each other, to remind each other that the main thing, the main focus is still his kingdom, not our own. Because the enemy will do everything he can to get you to take your attention off God's kingdom and onto your own. So you'll find yourself serving God in whatever way and capacity. There's a hundred, there's a thousand, there's a million different ways in which God will use you to advance his kingdom. So I'm not going to tell you how he's going to do it because it's going to look different for each and every one of you. But you'll be there doing everything you can to put God's kingdom first at your work, at home, with your friends, when you go to the club to play sports. And the enemy will throw everything he can at you. He'll throw financial stress your way. He'll throw um, relational tension your way. He'll throw emotional abuse from your boss if he can your way. He will throw stress and pressure and a busy schedule your way. He'll throw everything your way as you're trying to build and advance God's kingdom. And the moment you, you decide, hang on, let me just take a step back and focus on just fixing all these things that are going on. Then I'll, I'll go back to working on God's kingdom. He says, I'll have you. And so now I'm going to throw financial opportunity and breakthrough your way. I'll give you a job promotion. I'll give you a great friend, a new friend, great relationships. I'll give you emotional peace. I'll even give you a lot of free time. And so you think, oh, wow, this is working. I'm, I must keep working on this, this stuff. It's, it's clearly doing something. I'm being successful. And the devil is just like, as long as you're not working in God's kingdom, I'll give you all the success, all the earthly treasure you want. Because I know it's temporary. I know at the end of the day, it's not going to last. You see, this is more of an opinion, so take this as an opinion, but I don't think the devil is focused on getting every believer to come to his side. I think he knows to win the, minority, the majority, you lose the minority. And I think he knows it takes too much to try to get a mature believer, a Jesus-loving believer, to completely throw it all away and come over to his side. But I think he knows it's far less and far more practical for me to spend the time and the energy getting a mature believer, getting a Jesus-loving believer, distracted enough that they forsake the work of God's kingdom. So he's almost like, I might not get you, but as long as you bring no one with you, that's okay. Right? As long, I'll even give you success as long as you don't bring anyone closer to Jesus. It's like, if I can get you, I'll take you. But you're, I know you really love Jesus. I can't see you throwing that away. But just make sure... You don't give that to everyone, anyone else. See, Matthew tells us where our treasure is, there our heart is. So the question today is, where is our, our hearts? Where is our treasures? What do we desire most? What do we put the most importance on? And it's really, more than anything, a perspective change. See, if you read Matthew, it tells you that the eye is a, is a light to the body, and if the eye is good, the whole body is good. And I speak of perspective. Oftentimes, the thing we need to change is not what we're doing, it's how we look at what we're doing. That changes everything. So the question is, are you putting God's kingdom first? Are you putting that eternal desire to advance and to build his kingdom at the top of your heart in everything that you do? You see, some of us want to escape the mundane of life because we feel like there's more. But it's not necessarily that we have to go and do something spectacular. You see, when we put God's kingdom first, that desire first, the mundane becomes extraordinary for us. Suddenly, just doing the everyday stuff has meaning to it because we know, even though if I was just doing this for myself, it would end up coming to nothing in the long run because I'm doing this for God. It's going to last an eternity. It's going to count towards my eternal life. So where's our treasure? Where are our hearts at? I want to end with this verse and, and this kind of thought. Um, Romans 3 verse 37 says this. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Before Paul says this, he's talking about overcoming hardships and, and persecutions and, and all this stuff. And afterwards, he's speaking about how nothing's going to separate us from, from the love of Christ. And so it's almost like he's talking about things that we're going to have to overcome, things that we would have to conquer, things that would try to separate us 
from God's love. But he doesn't say in all these things we are conquerors. He says in all these things we are more than conquerors. So it got me thinking a bit. Who is greater than the one who conquers a kingdom? And the only answer I could come to is the one who builds a kingdom. The one who builds is greater than the one who conquers. You see, the world recognizes the need for builders and creators. God called us to create. He called us to build marvelous and new things. And for too long, I feel like the devil has had us in reactive mode, in overcoming, in conquering mode, where we're just having to overcome his attacks, overcome his schemes, overcome his plans. And it's almost like he's doing this because he doesn't want us to get to that space where we begin to create, we begin to build things. See, when will we stop having to pray and fight in the spirit for cancer to be cured in people's bodies? When will a Christian doctor or scientist come along and invent the cure for it? When are we going to have to stop praying and and, and fighting against poverty in the church? When are we going to start building and creating wealth within the church? When are we going to have to stop overcoming all these things and instead build and create the solutions to all these things? If you look at the world, some of the richest people in the world, people like Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, all those people, they're all builders, they're all creators. And that is why they're some of the richest people in the world. You see, the world recognizes the need and the value of builders and creators. So let us also see the value and the importance in being kingdom builders. Let us see the importance of building God's kingdom. And what greater way to build God's kingdom than to collect that which is precious, that which is of great value to his kingdom, heavenly treasure. And there is one, I'm not saying it's the only one, but it's the one I'm going to speak about this morning, that we get to collect here on earth that gets stored up for us in heaven. There is treasure we get to collect here on earth, but it's stored in eternity for us. And that is souls for Jesus Christ. That is people closer to Jesus. Jesus commissions all of us, go and make disciples. Why disciples? Because disciples is a mature believer that brings other people closer to Jesus. And so there is a role for each of us, whether we are a plumber, a doctor, a businessman, an accountant, a mother, a grandfather. There's a role and a, and, and a function for each of us where we are in the environment we are to draw people closer to Jesus. We have a role in the winning, the nurturing, and the retention of souls until the master comes to collect them one day. The reason I, I, I love our, our, our vision statement for this church is because it, it takes that, that, that idea, that concept of winning, of nurturing, and the retention of souls, and it puts it in a simple phrase, draw people closer to Jesus. And I can't tell you how that's going to look, because it could look so different for you than it looks for me. You see, for me, it looks like a Friday night spending time with these crazy bunch of people. For you, it might look like having a coffee with a friend you haven't seen in a while and hearing their story and telling them that there's still hope, things are going to be okay. It's going to look different. It might look like you reaching out to that son that you haven't spoken to in a long time and saying, I'm still hoping for you. I'm still believing in you. Whatever it looks like, we all have a role, wherever we are. And I can promise you this, if you put advancing God's kingdom first, if you put that desire first, nothing else will compare to it. Seek first his kingdom and all these other things he's going to take care of. The issue is sometimes, I don't know if I should go there. Should I go there? I'm going to go there. If you read the beginning of Matthew, I'm going to end with this. I'm going to end with this. Because we know it's important to put God first. But sometimes we get things backwards, and we put that which we want God to give us first. We put not seeking his kingdom first, but all the other things first. But sometimes we first seek his kingdom, and he gives us all these other things. And then once he's given it to us, once he's satisfied all the the other desires we have, whether it's the desire for marriage, whether it's the desire for for wealth or, or freedom or whatever it is, once he's satisfied all those desires, we stop seeking his kingdom first, and we begin to shift our attention to those desires. You see, if you read the beginning of Matthew, Joseph is warned by an angel to take Jesus and Mary and flee to Egypt 
because Herod is trying to now kill Jesus. And so Egypt becomes a place of provision for Joseph, Jesus, and Mary. And it's the same for Israel when they left and they fled the famine. It became a place of provision. Egypt was a place of provision for Israel when they went there to get, get away from the famine. But you know the difference between the two? Is when God told Joseph to take Jesus and Mary and leave Egypt, once Herod had passed on, they left. But the nation of Israel stayed in captivity in Egypt. Because Joseph kept his eyes on the provider, not the provision. The Israelites got comfortable in the provision and they lost sight of the provider. So that which was provision became their captive. And so the moment we make something else first above God, it becomes our master. And so even if it was provision originally from God, because we make that the object of our focus and not the provider, it will keep us captive. And so God will provide and he will satisfy many desires that you have, many temporal desires that only last this lifetime. He will satisfy them. Maybe not all of them, but he will satisfy beyond your wildest dreams. But we are tasked with keeping his kingdom first, that eternal desire first, so that we may not live in captivity to the desires of this lifetime, but we may live constantly out of a place of the eternal life and purpose he's given each and every one of us. I think I'm just going to close in prayer. Cool, cool. Lord, I just want to thank you for everyone here today. You know where they are. You know their hearts, Lord. And we know, Lord, it's so easy sometimes to get caught up in the temporary because it's there, it's in our face, it's every day. So help us to keep the perspective on the eternal, on your kingdom, Lord, and advancing your kingdom. And so give us sight, Lord, to see where in our everyday environments, in our everyday interactions, where we find ourselves already, Lord, what the kingdom role, what the kingdom work is, Lord. And give us the heart, give us the courage to put that first, Lord, over reputation, over success, over likability, over whatever wants to come against it, Lord. Help us always put you first so that when you say move like this, move there, do that, it's easy for us to say, I'm going there because it's my heart's desire to do that more than anything else. God was so good, he made it easy for us. He put the desire to do his work in our hearts from the beginning. We just have to make sure we cultivate it so that it doesn't get pressed down by all the other desires of life. So help us, God, to trust you enough to say, I will forsake all other desires and trust you to fulfill them in your time, in your plan, as you will it. I'm just going to focus on your kingdom. I'm just going to focus on you and what you're saying to me and what you want for me in and through this moment. And so I pray, Lord, that our hearts will be forever turned towards you and your kingdom, Lord. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace all the days of your life. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.